Hi, Jonathan Stewart here. My main area of photography is remote travel and adventure photography, and that means getting out far from civilization, which I usually do on foot. I'm often asked how I pack for long treks, so I thought I'd do a video about what's in my bag for trekking. There are two types of treks that I typically take. The shorter treks, usually here in California or elsewhere in North America, where I'm carrying all my own gear, my sleeping bag, tent, food, stove, etc. And the longer treks uh, in the third world, like Peru or Nepal or Mongolia. In those places, I'll generally hire porters or horses. So let's start with the self-contained trek, where I'm carrying all my own gear. Now, when I was in my 20s, it was no big deal to carry 60 or 70 pounds or 25 to 35 kilos all day long through the mountains. But like all of us, I'm not getting any younger and I've got nothing left to prove. Uh, so these days, my domestic trekking is mainly fast packing, where I take as light a pack as possible and try to cover as much ground each day as I can. Unfortunately, that generally means leaving the DSLR at home. If I've got 25 pounds or 12 kilos of gear and food, there's no way I can bring another 10 plus pounds of camera and hope to keep up with my crazy friends who are all trying to kill me anyways. And guys, if you're listening, you know who you are. So because of that, on that type of trip, I'll just take my compact. And for my money, the best compact you can take right now is the Sony RX100 M3. This thing has the image quality comparable to an entry-level DSLR, a relatively large sensor and lens apertures for compact, a viewfinder which comes in handy in bright light, and access to the Sony App Store uh, so you can do in-camera time lapse and even star trails. Uh, just beware of battery usage. A time lapse or star trail taking two hours to make can use up uh, an entire battery, but generally uh, I calculate about one battery per day for the typical mix of stills and video when using just the RX. Batteries are fairly light and the generic ones can be had on Amazon.com for about $5 and they work just fine even though they won't go through as many charge cycles as the $40 original Sony batteries. Now for the longer treks, there are more decisions to be made about choosing what gear to bring. The first thing is to take a look at your shooting style to figure out which lenses to take. Now even though zooms are more flexible, I prefer the, uh, the image quality and low light capabilities of prime lenses, and a prime lens will also be lighter than a zoom. Yes, you have to take more of them to cover all of your focal lengths, but in a minute I'll show you why that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, so at first, I had a tendency to overpack on a trek. I'd take the whole kit plus the kitchen sink, and while it was nice to have lots of options, it wasn't absolutely necessary, and it slowed me down, not only with all the extra weight, but with changing lenses all the time, when really, I probably didn't need to. So these days, I try to keep my kit to around three or four lenses. For instance, I'm getting ready to take a three-week trek into the Himalayas in a month. I'll be shooting landscapes, uh, people, uh, both indoors and outdoors, and there should be some spectacular night skies. So my kit breaks down as follows. I'll always take... Uh, my 20mm f2.8. This one happens to be uh, an old Minolta. It's lightweight and a terrific focal length both for close-up environmental portraiture and for dramatic landscapes. The 20 is also good for video shooting. Second, I'll always pack a standard fast prime, either my Sigma 35mm f1.4 or my Zeiss 50mm f1.4. Now it just so happens that my Zeiss 50 uh, is lighter and more compact uh, focuses faster, especially in extreme cold, and has some weatherproofing that the Sigma doesn't have. So uh, on this particular trip, the Zeiss gets the nod. Third, I take along a fast portrait lens. The people you encounter out there are just so fascinating. You want a great lens to shoot them, to get those headshots and that you know narrow depth of field and blow out your background. Uh, so for that, I will take along the Zeiss 85mm f1.4. Uh, sometimes I take the Zeiss 135, 1.8, but for Nepal, I'll be taking the 85, which is lighter weight and more compact. Finally, uh, I'll be taking my Sigma 15 millimeter uh, full frame fisheye on this trip, uh, but most of the time I will leave this guy at home. Uh, I figure the fisheye is great for the night skies and some unusual angles and effects on the Tibetan Buddhist structures that, that I'll be encountering out there in the Himalayas. It's not that heavy an addition, but if I did need to cut weight, this would be the first to go. So how do I carry all this stuff? Uh, I haven't found a backpack that can carry a large amount of trekking gear and has a dedicated photography function. Uh, there are lots of backpacks out there for photography, but none for extended trekking and photography. So I've come up with my own system. Now, if anybody knows of uh, a better backpack or has a system that they think is easier, by all means, please tell me about it in the comments. I'm not saying this is the best system out there. I'm just saying this is what I found works for me right now. Okay, so the lenses will ride in the main portion of my 
uh, pack protected in their cases and in a Ziploc bag. And these particular cases I take because they're all interchangeable in size so that no matter what lens I'm swapping for which, uh, I'll always be able to have a case that's going to fit. Now I've seen some trekkers uh, carry their camera exposed around their neck when they trek. But for a guy like me who tends to sweat and who needs uh, his hands free for his trekking poles, that's just not an option. So to keep my camera at hand and protected at all times, I'll show you what I use. I use this case, which is the Low Pro Top Loader Pro, uh, Pro 65 AW. This fits the body and the lenses that I typically take. And uh, let me slide this in here. And this buckle provides some nice security and easy access for the camera uh, when I'm hiking. When it's particularly dusty or it starts to drizzle, I'll close the zipper. And the case does offer some slight water resistance. It's not going to protect in heavy rain, but closing the zipper is going to be good enough for most of the light rain you'll encounter out there. Uh, it does have a built-in rain guard that's kind of tucked away behind here, but with all these straps and connections, it's highly impractical to use. So when things really get nasty out, I'll unstrap everything, uh, throw it in the main backpack and cover the back, uh, cover the whole thing with the rain cover. So my system is to run my backpack belt through the case, then uh, clip the case to the pack in two places to stabilize it. So the first place is where uh, the waist belt connects to the main body of the pack. And the second place is up here on the shoulder strap. Now both of these will keep the uh, camera nice and stable and this top carabiner will help keep the pack from uh, bouncing around and hitting my thigh. Now one side effect of strapping the camera up here is that it, it does place some weight on the shoulder and it can make the pack feel slightly asymmetrical and uneven. So what I can do is unclip it from the shoulder strap. And that takes some of the weight off the shoulders. Uh, but uh, at the end of a long day, sometimes it can get annoying to have this thing uh, hitting, hitting the thigh. So when that happens, then I will clip it, off, clip it back up here. And that, that changes the weight distribution a little bit and it'll keep it off my thigh. Regardless, it's just nice to have the option to move things around. Okay, now, uh, if you have a smaller camera, by all means, get a smaller pack. You want to minimize the amount that you're carrying here. Okay, and one trick that I will use, let me just show you really quick, is I will uh, sometimes put the neck strap of the camera through the uh, through the shoulder strap of the pack so that when I'm shooting it doesn't interfere. I'll just carry it up like that and pull it like that. And if I should happen to drop the camera for whatever reason or I get bumped, camera falls, it doesn't go any lower than my knee, and it's just one more layer of protection to keep the camera from falling off a cliff and getting broken or lost. Okay, now, uh, talking a little bit, again, about weight, and one reason why I prefer the uh, prime lenses to the zooms. Uh, as I mentioned, I like to keep this part of the pack as lightweight as possible to keep it from bouncing and, and uh, bothering me as I hike. Now, if I were to have uh, extra weight in here of a zoom, say a 24 to 70 f 2.8, it's going to be heavier, it's going to be bigger, I'm going to need a bigger pack, and that's going to change the, um, the whole equation. So another thing I do when I trek is I take the shoulder strap that comes with this case, so I can take it off from my backpack, just put it around my shoulder, and I'll take this extremely lightweight and compactable uh, little backpack, it's made by a company called, what's it called, uh, Sea to Summit, and I can throw, you know, some water, a snack, maybe an extra lens in here and a jacket, and I can take day hikes at the end of the day through the village or, you know, just a little bit of exploration around camp. Okay, so this trip to Nepal, I'll also take this small Leica monocular for spotting wildlife and for route finding. And I'll also take my Sony RX100 M3, which is what I'm using to shoot this video right now. And I'll use that for time lapses, star trails, videos as I walk, and the occasional still and as a backup in case something happens to my Sony A99. Uh, both of those will fit in the pockets on the low pro, so I'll have quick and easy access to them at all times. Uh, the big issue, of course, is batteries. Now, in many routes in Nepal, and sometimes in Peru, you will pass through a village with electricity, and if you bring a charger, you can charge your batteries uh, as you go. Now, another option is a solar charger, but I found that the solar charging systems really aren't that practical. And the good ones are very expensive and heavy anyhow. So for me, the best option is just brute force and just bringing a ton of batteries. Now, if there are no charging options along the way, as will be the case when I go to the upper Dolpo, 
My strategy is one DSLR battery for every one and a half days of shooting and one RX battery for every two days of shooting. And that works for me when I'm using both cameras simultaneously and not either one exclusively. Now, the problem is uh, on an extended trek, the batteries do lose capacity over the course of time and the cold weather doesn't help matters. In fact, in extreme cold, uh, it's important to keep your batteries as warm as possible because even a fully charged battery will be totally spent after just a couple dozen shots if not kept warm. So if you want to have a live camera all the way through uh, a long track, you've got to bring a shit ton of batteries. Okay, and don't skimp on memory cards either. With my A99, I record to uh, each of the dual SD cards, the 64 gig SD cards simultaneously in case one fails. So that's a nice way to have a backup. And I bring two 64 gig backups. And for the RX, I'll also bring uh, 128 gigs total. Now remember, it, when you go trekking, there will be no best buys out there on the trail. So bring more than you think you're going to need. Okay, so that's my packing strategy. Uh, now, how do I use the stuff when I trek? Well, that's a good topic for another video. If you've got any suggestions for a better system, I'm eager to hear about it. Please leave me a comment and don't forget to subscribe, like, and all that stuff. See the video description below for more information on my website and Facebook. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for my next video from the Upper Dolpo region of Nepal.